I think that the more people travel, the more they come to understand that things are different out there. And I think that that's what makes you a better person as a traveler too, is you just gain this cultural understanding of different places, different people. Uh, it makes you a more interesting person too. Welcome to Deep Dive with me, Sean C. Fettig. You might remember last season, I did an episode with some friends of mine about our shared love for travel. The pandemic influenced all of us and our travels in very different ways. Heidi and Tony got stuck in the Philippines for nearly a year. Shannon took advantage of traveling around the States, and I visited Mexico quite a few times. This year, though, we all hope to get back to our regular schedules of hopping around the world, but the industry has had a difficult time finding its groove again. Prices for vacation and car rentals have soared. Flights have been delayed and canceled as airlines have struggled with demand. And cruises just started leaving port again after more than a year off the water. All of this has created the potential for challenges and frustrations at every stage of the travel process. I know that I've gotten very adept at changing flights and routes at the last minute and recouping credits for canceled flights and finding vacation rentals in awkward locations at the last minute, and settling for things I normally would not. In this new travel landscape, I thought it would be a good idea to talk to an expert about consumer rights and expectations as the industry warms up again. So today I'm talking to Christopher Elliott, founder and chief advocacy officer of Elliott Advocacy, a consumer rights organization that empowers consumers to solve their problems and help those who can't as well as the author of numerous travel books, including How to Be the World's Smartest Traveler and Save Time, Money, and Hassle, and Scammed, How to Save Your Money and Find Better Service in a World of Schemes, Swindles, and Shady Deals. Christopher also writes numerous regular columns for outlets such as Washington Post, Seattle Times, USA Today, National Geographic, and Forbes. He's also a contributor to NPR, Smithsonian, and Travel and Leisure. And because he's not busy enough, he also publishes The Elliott Report, which is a news site for consumers, and Elliott Confidential, a subscription newsletter that contains travel news and customer service. In our conversation, we talk about the challenges consumers face and the rights consumers enjoy related to flights, vacation rentals, cruises, car rentals, and travel insurance. So we talk about things like when and how to get your money back for a delayed or canceled flight warning words to look for in vacation rental ads, how to find the location of a vacation rental even when you don't have the address, when you can get a refund from Airbnb or Verbo, if cruises are safe, if you should get travel insurance, how to avoid surprise post-facto car rental charges, and the best approach to take when appealing for a refund or an apology. If you like this episode, or any episode, please feel free to give it a like on your favorite podcast platform, and or subscribe to the podcast on YouTube. And as always, if you have any thoughts, questions, or comments, please email deepdivewithshawn at gmail.com. Let's do a deep dive. So Christopher, thanks for taking the time to be here. I'm excited to have this conversation with you. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. So let's start at the obvious beginning can you tell me, and by extension, I suppose, listeners, a little bit about Elliott Advocacy and what it is that you do? Sure. I mean, Elliott Advocacy is a consumer organization that helps people solve their consumer problems. We do it mostly through a lot of self-help on the website. So I publish uh, stories about you know, how to dispute your credit card or how to book an airline ticket or how to uh, resolve a problem with an appliance that doesn't work anymore. And uh, I also publish uh, executive contacts for just about every major company in the United States. So that if you do have a problem and someone is telling you that you, you can't get the email of the CEO, well, I publish the name of the CEO and the email address. So you can always appeal to that person. And that does work too. And then if that doesn't work, if you can't advocate your case yourself, then I have a team here of people who will help you and uh, we'll go to bat for you and see if we can get you an apology or a refund. You provide support and advocacy across a broad range of issues. I want to focus on our conversation today on travel, because travel today seems to be 
I don't know, for lack of a better word, a nightmare, both like in theory and in practice. So if you are traveling, chances are you're experiencing hiccups at some stage. And if you're considering travel, you're probably reading and hearing horror stories about what to expect. So what are some issues that people are experiencing and can expect to experience when they're traveling today? You know, I find your question very interesting because um, you've made an assumption that most people are flying um, because mm-hmm. you, you, you kind of made an oblique reference to air travel being as bad as it is. And it is really terrible, Sean. Uh, I don't have to tell you that. But the truth is most Americans drive to their destination. It's something like nine out of 10 trips. It's really ridiculous. And for them, actually, it was a pretty good summer. Uh, gas prices were down and maybe it was a little bit crowded, but they, uh, everything went pretty smoothly. They did their trips to the national parks or wherever they go camping. And, but if, if you're talking about air travel, and this is, this is something that I think a lot of us media types do, is we just assume everyone flies. <laughs> so of course, that's not true. But if you did fly, then you, boy, were you in for a treat this summer. Talking about on you know, June, more than 3% of all flights were canceled. 20% of all flights were delayed. Um, most of them by an hour or more. It's crazy. So that's what we're dealing with right now. And it probably is going to continue into the busy holiday travel season. So I'm going to be very, very busy. And it, you're probably listening to this podcast thinking, how can I avoid something like this? And I'm just dying to tell you. <laughs> okay, so let's do that then. Okay. I, I do want to touch on specific elements of travel, but I suppose before we get there, generally for people that cannot avoid travel or, or, or don't want to avoid travel. And, and you mentioned this a bit with driving, but are there any particular places or types of travel that people can be doing to minimize the potential for disruption or frustration? Well, yeah, uh, obviously driving will um, minimize the frustration with flying. If you're driving and flying at the same time, uh, you're living in the future, you're driving one of those Jetsons cars. Mm. That definitely will help. Um, I think also it's where you fly. I'll just give you an example. If you want to fly somewhere at Thanksgiving and you decide you're going to fly to Europe, you're going to have the plane to yourself. No, they don't celebrate Thanksgiving in Europe. And so uh, no one flies from uh, Europe to the, or from the United States to Europe. Um, I have actually flown to Europe around Thanksgiving to visit friends. And um, I had half the, half the plane was empty. But if you're flying somewhere domestically, the plane is going to be overbooked. And there's a very good chance that if you booked a really cheap ticket, that uh, you might get bumped from that flight. And even if you're not bumped, your flight will probably get delayed, may even get canceled. They'll probably lose your luggage. It's just basic travel hellscape. Are there any steps that people can take pre-travel that would mitigate disruption? Or is that step simply prepare yourself? Yeah, I mean, I think that Planning is, is 99% of, of, of avoiding a bad experience. It's if you can carefully plan your trip, and specific to flights, everyone likes to travel or to fly in you know the mid-morning. They like that uh, 10 a.m. flight from uh, Orlando to New York. It's convenient. You can get up at a reasonable hour. You can get to the airport. But everyone does it. So my advice is always, if you can get the first flight of the day out, not only will you avoid the crowds, you'll get the business travelers, but also as you go on later in the day, there's a higher chance that your flight is going to get canceled, uh, maybe because of weather or something else, air traffic. And so as you go farther and farther toward the end of the day, you actually um, may get canceled and you may have to spend the night at the airport or go home. So planning is like really, really important. Also, if you can avoid the really busy holiday travel season, that's also something that you know people don't necessarily think of. They always um, move kind of in lockstep and they say, well, the, that Tuesday or Wednesday before Thanksgiving, that's when I want to fly. Guess what? That's when everyone else wants to fly too. So if you can avoid that, you can really plan a smoother trip. So you've already kind of segued into this, but let's play, break it down by elements of travel. And we can start with flights. If a flight is canceled, or, or significantly delayed, what can someone expect from the airline? I'm glad you asked this because uh, the DOT, the Department of Transportation, which regulates air travel, just has had a real heart-to-heart talk with all the airlines about what you can expect. And basically, if your flight is uh, delayed by more than two hours, you can expect either a refund 
or they'll book you on the next flight. But a lot of airlines have publicly come forward and said, you know what we'll do? We'll give you vouchers uh, for, a, for a meal. We'll give you, a, um, if you have to stay overnight, we'll, we'll give you a hotel. Uh, those are things that weren't codified before. And now under the current uh, administration, they have been codified. You can find your rights in something that's called the contract of carriage. That's the legal agreement between you and the airline. And that contract of carriage is on the website. A lot of folks uh, read it for the very first time when they're delayed. And that's not the time you, when you want to read it. You want to know what's in that contract before you get on the plane or before you go to the airport uh, so that you are aware of what your rights are. So those are some of the things that I think people uh, should know about. The Department of Transportation has a really great website that shows you what your rights are. But um, if you want a second opinion, you can always go to my site, which is Elliot.org. That's E-L-L-I-O-T-T dot O-R-G. Shameless plug. Sorry. So an extension of that is, does the contract still apply if you book through a third party vendor? It does. Yes. And is that true for airlines, hotels, car rental as well? Well, car rentals and hotels are slightly different. Those are both regulated at the state level. Um, and they don't, well, car rental companies do have agreements with their customers. But with a hotel, the agreement, sometimes you don't even know what it is until you arrive and they say sign here. And it basically says, I'm, gonna, I'm going to pay my hotel bill. But you have, each state has its own lodging laws. And so um, you can find out what those are. They're very, um, industry friendly, as you can probably imagine. But the neat thing is that a lot of hotel chains also have customer commitments where they say, oh, we're so great. We're going to take really good care of you. And you can take those commitments. Sometimes you can hold the hotel's feet to the fire when they're not doing right and say, look, you just published this great customer commitment that said, we love our customers. And now you're giving me a surcharge for staying an extra hour in the, in the hotel room and there's a 350 charge for smoking, but I don't smoke, whatever it is, you know, or a resort fee, those are people hate those. And you can go back to the customer commitment and say, guys, what's going on here? I am absolutely guilty of not being familiar with any of the contracts when I buy a ticket for- you, Well, you and everyone else, Sean, <laughs> no one reads the contract. In my experience, and this has happened to me, is you know flights have been canceled or significantly shifted. Um, in fact, that just happened to me a week ago, um, and it wasn't it wasn't you know you get those notices when you if you book a flight and the flight changes that the flight has changed, and your assumption is that it's changed by a few hours, and in fact, mine it was an international flight had changed by a day and a half. Wow, and it's not entirely clear, or at least in my experience what your options are and what mm -hmm. you are afforded by law. So if you are do something by law, like a refund or some type of an accommodation, how do you ensure that you get it? So I have to ask you, um, where were you flying to? Santiago, Chile. And I was flying on Aero Mexico. Okay. All right. Well, the reason I ask is that some countries do have uh, very consumer friendly air travel, uh, consumer protections, um, if, you're, if you were flying to Europe, you probably could have gotten some money from the airline. But um, when an airline does not do what it says it's going to do, you know that's a really serious thing. And you can actually contact the Department of Transportation. They have their own kind of consumer help division. And they will, you know, if, they, if, if an airline promises you something and then doesn't deliver it, you can go to them and say, hey, they didn't do what they said they were going to do. And the DOT... Um, it has some enforcement uh, authority and they will contact the airline and they can often get the airline to do what it was supposed to do. If I'm flying out of the country, but from a domestic location, so in this case, flying out of like Seattle, but I'm flying on Aero Mexico, is Aero Mexico subject to United States law and policy or are they subject to Mexican law? Uh, they're subject to, if they're operating in the United States, they're subject to US laws. So you can, you can complain to the DOT. And in fact, if you look at the uh, DOT report card, they issue one every month, they will list the number of complaints they got for you know, whatever international carrier you were flying on. And they have to follow our laws because they're operating in our airspace. You know, I wanted to say one thing to you. Don't beat up on yourself about not reading the contract. And the reason I say that is that these contracts are written by very well-paid lawyers in a way that would make you not want to read them because they're just so incomprehensible, 
Sometimes they're rendered in all uppercase. Mm -hmm. It's like, get out of here. They don't want you to read these things. And the reason is, is they don't want you to know what your rights are. And they're so, you know, like once you understand what's in there after, you know, what, 40,000 words, you realize that could be truncated to a 10 word statement. (laughs) Okay. I'll tell you a funny story. Um, I've talked to airline um, executives before, and I've asked them to interpret what their contract says. And they couldn't agree on, they, not only did they not understand their contract, but they, we couldn't agree on what it actually said. Yeah, these, this is some of the, the best creative writing that I've ever seen in my life. My immediate thought was they should be teaching creative writing. But. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> are there any airlines that are better than others when it comes to travel disruption and uh, accommodation when it occurs? Yes, uh, there are. I mean, if you look at some of the customer service rankings, they're not too far off from the truth. For example, in the U.S., Southwest Airlines does a really good job. We just don't get very many complaints about Southwest Airlines because, uh, you know, we we publish their executives' names on our website. If someone has a problem, they will go to the executive. The executive will actually respond and fix the problem or ask someone to fix the problem. And then you have other legacy carriers that really don't want to be bothered. Uh, We also publish their contact information and they often will either ignore the email from a customer or they'll bounce it. You can manually bounce an email, which makes them think that the email is invalid, which is crazy. Can you imagine a CEO saying, I don't want to hear from any of my own customers, but that's exactly what's going on. That's the airline business for you. They're not a customer service business. Uh, They're basically a financial service business. They're trying to make money off of credit cards and rewards. So there's a narrative that, and I guess this is just, this is a binary, right? Europe and the United States is what I'm talking about. But in that binary, there's a narrative that Europe, from a regulatory perspective, does a much better job of protecting the consumer when it comes to travel Mm -hmm. than the United States does. One, is that true? And I guess, two, why is that? It's true, and it's because the EU has some of the strongest consumer protection laws. Uh, EC261 is the big consumer protection rule for air travelers, and airlines hate it because if there's a delay, they have to pay the customer. Uh, they have to issue prompt refunds. There's, there's so many things that you know you would think an airline would have to do. EC261 requires it. It does not exist in the, exist in the United States. So... Um, there is actually some talk right now of possibly bringing an EC two sixty one like law in the next FAA reauthorization bill. Wouldn't that be something? Hmm. And the likelihood of that <laughs> depends who wins the next election, right? Yeah. Okay, let's shift to talking about renting someone else's property. So here I'm talking about like Airbnb or Verbo. So first, how seriously should you take reviews? Because, and the reason I ask this is because I am not a review checker generally, and I don't know that that's good practice, but I have also traveled with people that are religious review checkers, and we can never find anything. <laughs> I am a serial user of vacation rentals. In fact, I'm living in one right now. I don't believe the reviews. Well, let's just say I read them, but I don't, I take them with a very large grain of salt, a truckload Mm -hmm. of salt. The place I'm in right now had a five-star review. It it was a relatively new property. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. The rate was good. Let's give it a try. It did not merit five stars. I don't know who gave them this review, but it did (laughs) not merit five stars. You know, it's in the communist part of Split. So I'm in Split, Croatia right now. And uh, there's the nice, beautiful inner city. And then as you go out out of town, it's these uh, concrete kind of apartments built during the communist era. And this is, as you might expect, a a communist uh, era apartment to look like. It's mismatched furniture, uh, sagging beds, pretty awful. Um, and And I'm here for an entire month. So that's a lot of really good material for my future column. But let me just say, uh, the, the review wouldn't have warned me away from this. And um, I think that you just have to do much more research if you want to know what you're getting. Uh, otherwise, you're just going to probably end up in a bad rental. So here's the issue for me with reviews is, and maybe at least in part by way of example, especially when I've traveled to like Mexico or Central American countries, is 
it seems as if people that come from like the United States or travelers from the United States, perhaps even Europe, are reviewing based on what they would expect in a rental in LA or in New York. And that's going to, that's not going to hold up very well against a rental on a small beach town in Mexico. Yeah. And so, you know, when you hear things like, well, you know, the Wi-Fi is spotty. (laughs) Yeah. Would never rent again or something. Like those are obvious to me signs in a review that I'm reading somebody that just had higher expectations than they should for the location. Uh, most travelers are pretty understanding. I mean, there, there are some idiots out there who would, who would do something like that and impose their, uh, impose their ha- unusually high standards on uh, a place where that's unreasonable. But I think most travelers understand that when they're going to another destination, that the standards are going to be different. Especially if you're a more experienced traveler, you know that you're not going to get fast Wi-Fi or even a microwave. I mean, our, our place here does not have a microwave oven and, uh, or a dishwasher. So even washing all our dishes by hand, it's totally fine. I mean, that's kind of what we expected. I think that the more people travel, the more they come to understand that things are different out there. And I think that that's what makes you a better person as a traveler, too, is you just gain this cultural understanding of different places, different people. Uh, it makes you a more interesting person, too. So let's move away from reviews then and talk about the listing itself. I think there are like kind of, I don't want to call them tropes, but there are things that we all kind of understand. You know, like if we see something like the word cozy, we know we're in for something smaller than it might appear. But what are some warning signs or red flags in a listing that would, you know, in a word is telling us a thousand things? Cozy is one of my favorite ones because it implies that it's something that uh, people want. And in fact, it's something people don't want. It's <laughs> very enclosed, like uh, the trash compactor in Star Wars that you feel very narrow and it's getting, the, the walls are closing in on you. Yeah. yeah so uh, when I see Cozy, um, I run for the hills usually. There are a couple of other ones. I did a whole story on uh, buzzwords, or not buzzwords, but really warning signs. I can tell you about the vacation rental I stayed in in Greece. We were in Athens, and it said it was an eclectic apartment. And mm. uh, that can be a lot of different things. Eclectic can just mean interesting art on the wall. But what it meant was not just interesting art on the wall. It meant that there was no kitchen. The kitchen was actually inside a closet. It meant that uh, the bathrooms, actually, there was one bathroom that was in a closet as well. I don't know who designed this thing. Not the same as the no, kitchen. Not, no, 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 not the same <laughs> closet. It was a different closet. I was just shocked by some of the things that they had. Uh, I guess maybe if you're the right guest, you're going to say, oh, this is just great. But um, the, the kitchen, they had an area where you could clean dishes, but it was inside a hallway. It's just so, mm. so bizarre. And the apartment itself looked like it had been, uh, that a wrecking ball had been taken to the side of it. It was just unbelievable. Um, secluded is another one of my favorite ones. When you see secluded, it means it's far away from everything. You're going to be driving half an hour to get to the grocery store or more. When I see the word urban, for instance, it immediately transmits dangerous to me. And uh, and I know because I've stayed in a couple of urban properties and yeah, you probably want to be suburban. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and then uh, there are others. Uh, classic is another one. Classic just means the furniture is worn out. Mm-hmm. Romantic. Romantic means don't bring your kids because it's just good for two people, basically. I love warm. <laughs> when I see the word warm, I mean, it looks like the air conditioning probably doesn't work. I don't know. Oh, like literally warm. <laughs> <laughs> That's- so there's, you know, I think that if you avoid these words when you're looking at a vacation rental description, then you probably will f- find something that's right for you. So Airbnb in the last few years has done this, and I don't want to knock Airbnb, but they've been doing this thing where they're kind of promoting almost artistic photos of places. And, you know, it's almost like there are professionals taking photos. Um, and, th- and so you'll get a picture of an apple on a table or something. And stage shots. Yeah, for sure. And I can see the appeal to that. But what I feel like I've lost, you know, from when I was booking a few years ago to now is I don't always 
actually get a sense of what I'm walking into. You know, I don't get a sense yeah. of the dimensionality. I don't get a sense of how things are laid out or the proportions. Absolutely. Uh, and and uh, if I see a stage shot, that's a warning sign too. It means they're trying to hide something. Especially if I see just a stage shot in one or two pictures, maybe of a bedroom with uh, towels on the bed and chocolates on, you know, mint on the pillow. That means they're really trying to hide something. You want to see at least a dozen photos of the key areas, the kitchen, the bathrooms, all the bathrooms. Uh, you want to see a photo of the bedrooms and the living room from a couple of different angles. If they're not showing that, then they're hiding something. And one other thing that I've just discovered is that, you know, wall units for air conditioning, they're still a big thing in a lot of places. And so if they say they have an air conditioning, look for a wall unit in the bedroom wall too. Mm. Ours just has one wall unit in the living room and we're roasting in the bedrooms. Mm. When I'm looking, I think innately, I'm also always looking for at least one outside shot. Like either what is the view from the window or what is the view of the street? Yeah, absolutely. And they don't re really reveal the address until you book. So you don't right. know where it is. The nice thing is that you can do a reverse photo lookup and you can oftentimes find, because they cross list it, they'll cross list it on VRBO and Airbnb and sometimes on a private rental. Um, there's a really cool website called HiChi, H-I-C-H-E-E.com that allows you to uh, look up where a rental is listed. And so you can, you can go and uh, find out the address and then you can look around and find out where are the closest grocery stores. Um, is this in a high crime neighborhood? You can do a crime map search and find out if you're gonna get shot when you walk out the door. In a lot of places, I mean, I'm not kidding about this. Yeah, there are no, a lot of places that are in, like in a really in dangerous neighborhoods where you wouldn't want to ever live. And I get complaints about it all the time. Like I feared for my life and I had to check out. So when is it appropriate to request a refund? And I suppose by extension, what is Airbnb's policy? Yeah, Airbnb has, and, and VRBO too, they both have refund policies. If something major goes wrong, like um, the power goes out, or there's no water, uh, or there's something in the apartment that's dangerous that uh, you know could potentially kill you, or if there's something that was described in the listing that wasn't there. So let's say that it says it's a three bedroom and there's only two bedrooms. Those are all grounds for um, getting an immediate refund, and they they'll actually find you a, a new uh, vacation rental as well, which is I think is great. The, the catch, though, is that if it's more expensive, they may charge you a little bit extra. So you have to always ask, you know, how much more is this going to cost me? I've had a couple of cases where that has happened. But the, the times when you get into kind of like a borderline situation is when someone says, oh, you know, I just don't feel comfortable here. Well, OK, can you describe why you don't feel comfortable? That's kind of hard to it's very difficult to um quantify something like that. Like, well, can, can the uh, host come by and try to make you feel more comfortable or what? There are other things too that are very difficult, like smells, for example. Mm -hmm. I was staying in a vacation rental where the neighbor next door smoked a lot. I don't smoke. How do you tell someone that you don't want to stay in the apartment because of the smoke smell? That's really difficult. So there's a lot of like these borderline cases where people think they're, they are, they're owed a full refund, and in fact, they're not. It is absolutely true that there's a fine line, and, I, and, and people are different. I'm a very forgiving traveler, I think, but I don't know that that's to my benefit. So, you know, I've definitely been in places where, you know, I needed Wi-Fi, and Wi-Fi didn't extend outside of the bathroom, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. or places where there's a very strong gas smell, and that can't be great, right? I'm not even sure where my limit is because I'm often just very forgiving, mainly because I've been on the other side of this, not as you know somebody renting out my property, but I've had friends that do. And you know, they're inundated sometimes with some guests that are like, well, I can't find a colander. And now, you know, my friend is literally doing, you know, same day delivery from Amazon of a colander to the house or something. And I guess the question is, 
am I doing myself a disservice by not pointing out glaring problems? Well, yeah, you should definitely point out a problem. I think the colander is a really good example because a a lot of people like to cook in their vacation rentals. And if they don't have a colander, then it's going to be hard to, you know, make your salad or spaghetti or whatever. And if it's missing, you should let your host know. Hosts are usually really accommodating. And for example, our host here, we told her that we could not sleep on the beds. They were, uh, they were these really saggy communist era mattresses. And I said, is there any way just to get like one of those memory foam tops? And we, you know, that would make things better. And she went out and bought them the same day and brought them over. It was, she was very nice about it. So if you have a, if you need, you know, knives are a big thing in vacation rentals because they never have enough and they're never sharp enough. So if you tell your uh, host, hey, could you maybe, do you have an extra knife um, or a sharper knife that I could use? Uh, chances are they'll run out to uh, Home Depot or wherever and, and get you a knife. Okay, let's switch to talking about cruises. They were almost like the canary in the coal mine at the beginning of COVID. And I just, I mean, I could not imagine. I've never taken a cruise in my life. I personally don't really see the appeal, but I could not imagine being on a cruise ship at the time that a global pandemic hits. But okay, so we're you know three years in, and the question is, are cruises safe now? They're as safe as they're ever going to be. Uh, I never thought that cruises were safe. Some are more safe than others, but you still have the risk of infection, not just coronavirus, but norovirus. That's always been a big thing where everyone on the ship is getting sick and vomiting. You know, it's a floating Petri dish. People are going to get sick. And there's nothing you can do about it. You can maybe uh, tell people to mask up or to use the hand sanitizers, but people are still going to get sick. If you are very risk averse or if you are immunocompromised, I would not recommend a cruise. But if you're young and healthy and you you want to see the Caribbean on the cheap, this is a really good way of doing it. So it's, it's not for everyone, but some people might really enjoy it. I mean, I just got off a cruise a couple of weeks ago of the Norwegian fjords, we took a really small ship cruise and um, people were doing it basically for the scenery. The, the mm-hmm. ship itself was, uh, you know, the amenities were very minimal, very Scandinavian, but the views were just beautiful. And uh, so, uh, you know, people cruise for all kinds of different reasons. Um, you can get into places that you never would be able to get to on a small ship. Do you know, how cruise ships have adjusted their protocols or if they have to ensure, you know, enhanced safety in the COVID era? A lot of talk and a little bit of action, pretty much. Mm -hmm. They have talked so much about how they have these increased safety protocols and, you know, masking and sanitizing and all that. From what I can tell, talking to cruise uh, insiders is that, yeah, at the beginning, they did religiously scrub down their ships even more than they had before because they were afraid of, we didn't understand COVID. They didn't know how it was going to get, get transmitted. So they just went crazy. But now it's more back to the way it was before. They're still talking about it a lot, but uh, they're not really doing many things that differently. Maybe they're using, you know, they're sanitizing more often. Maybe they're, I mean, I'll give you an example. When I was on this cruise ship, uh, when you go to dinner, they insist that you use the hand sanitizer. It's not optional. So you can't just walk through. They're like, eh, over there, use it. And you go, but I just washed my hands. Use the hand sanitizer. Mm-hmm. So yeah, they're, they're being a little strict, more strict about it. But still, I think it's really more talk than anything else at this point. You mentioned that cruises are kind of Petri dishes. And so I'm wondering, what avenues do people have, if any, on a cruise, if there is some type of a breakout, so not specific to COVID, you know, even food poisoning. Is that some, is that a risk that you're just assuming as a traveler or do you have some recourse if that happens? Get travel insurance. That's the first thing I would say. Uh, Many cruise passengers don't do it. And so they get sick and they get uh, left at a foreign port with no Western medical facilities. And then they have to pay you know, $10,000 to get admitted to a hospital that doesn't give them the right care. So travel insurance is really important. But your rights are actually outlined in something called the cruise contract. That's the ticket contract that you get when you book your cruise. It's what's called an adhesion contract, just like your airline contract, which means you you can't negotiate it. You have to agree to it. 
Mm. Some people, most people actually, agree to it without even realizing they agree to it. But the ticket contract doesn't give you rights as much as it takes them away. It basically says, the cruise ship can do anything and you can do nothing. I'm exaggerating a little bit. Right. The, uh, the cruise industry has a um, customer bill of rights that it hastily adopted about 10 years ago, just before Congress was getting ready to regulate the, the cruise industry. And, um, you know, it just gives you basic rights like, uh, you know, the right to a refund and uh, that sort of thing. If you want to have more rights, I would suggest that you stay on dry land. Hmm. You mentioned travel insurance. I always get travel insurance, but I've never had to use it. And I have, ha- I have heard some stories from folks that it was useless when they did need it. Are there any particular you know, things to keep in mind when getting travel insurance? Or are there any particular uh, companies that are better than others? Yeah. I mean, most people don't read their policy at all. Again, it, it's written by lawyers who don't want you to read it. Mm-hmm. Um, so my, my recommendation would be to read it and know what's, what's in it. There are two basic flavors of travel insurance. There's the regular name perils policy. So what that means is that they're naming something that they're going to uh, insure, such as if your uh, luggage is lost, that they'll give you um, a stipend or replace it. Or if you need a medical evacuation, that they'll pick you up and take you back to your back home or back to your home hospital. But then there's something called cancel for any reason. And what that does is it's a little bit more expensive and allows you to cancel your trip for any reason and get a refund of anywhere between 50% and 75%. Hmm. And the thing is, is that people don't know what's in their policies. They assume a lot of the time that they have canceled for any reason. So if something happens, something goes wrong, well, I've got insurance. I'll just call my insurance company and um, I'll file a claim and I'll get all my money back. Doesn't work that way. You have to have a named reason. You have to file a claim for a named reason in order for it to be valid. And even if you have cancel for any reason, you're not going to get everything back. You're only going to get 50 to 75%. Those are like the basic things that people don't understand about travel insurance. Let's talk about car rentals. I always do this. And I, and I don't know if this is risky, but is it okay to rely on your credit card to provide car rental insurance? Yeah, absolutely. I just did that yesterday and it's totally fine. The big catch, though, is whether your insurance is um, that your coverage on your credit card is primary or secondary. So if it's primary, that means that if you have to file a claim, your credit card will take over right away. But if it's secondary, you have to file a claim on your auto insurance first. And then if they don't cover it, you can go to your credit card company. Mm. People don't know the difference between primary and secondary, and then they think they're covered, but they're not. And uh, or it's a really long process of trying to get a refund because you have to go to your auto insurance and then you have to go to your credit card. And, and by then, your case is probably already in collections. Domestic car rental, pretty straightforward. International, not so much. And so I guess I'm wondering if there are any countries that are especially risky to rent a car. Car accidents are the number one cause of injury and death for tourists. So yes, it's very risky outside the United States to, well, it's even risky in the United States to drive, let alone rent a car. For American drivers, the challenges are people who drive on the wrong side of the road. So if you're going to be in the UK or South Africa and they drive on the left side of the road, that's really hard to get adjusted to. And I've actually had colleagues who have gotten killed by crossing the road without looking to the uh, on the right side. So in other words, you cross, you look to the right, you should be looking to the left, car comes and hits you. Insurance is a big issue. Countries like Jamaica, Israel, Ireland require that you buy insurance through the car rental company. You can't show up and say, I'm covered on my credit card. Uh, they need to see insurance that's from that country And that usually means that you have to go through the car rental company. Insurance also happens to be one of the biggest sources of profits for car rental companies. You probably think when you show up at the car rental counter that they're there to help you get a car. But what they're actually doing is upselling you. Mm -hmm. If you pay really close attention, you can catch on to that. 
they're trying to sell you an upgrade. They're trying to sell you insurance. And the way they sell you insurance is through scare tactics. I remember renting a car in Alaska one time. And when I declined the insurance, the woman pulled out a photo of, <laughs> of a car that had been, I'm not kidding, of a car that had, had apparently gone off-roading in Alaska, which is something I would never do. And it was trashed. She said, this could happen. It's Alaska. This could happen to your car. Are you sure? And I said, yes, I'm sure. <laughs> but I'm sure that other people fell for it too, uh, or, or fell for it. And um, so uh, I, I think you have to really be careful when it comes to insurance, because that can add $20 a day to your rental. Mm -hmm. And then the worst thing, of course, also is when you show up at the car rental counter to return your car or you show up in the lot and they do a very careful walk around and they say, oh, here's a ding, here's a dent, we'll be in touch. And the way actually to prevent that from being an issue is to take photos of your car before and after. And then if you do find something on the car before, like a little ding, you should let them know and get them to sign a, you know, sign your rental agreement saying there is a ding here. If it's a couple of dings, you should return the car. Don't even bother taking it. Find something that doesn't have any pre-existing damage because let me tell you, that damage is it's a source of profits again for the uh, car rental companies. They want you to bring something back with a ding because then they are going to charge you for it and they're going to make a little money off that repair. You know, and this is a motivator for me, frankly, or at least something that's, you know, top of mind when I'm renting a car outside of the United States. So foreign to me is I am more likely to be risk averse because I also don't, I don't understand necessarily their legal system. I don't understand, um, you know, I, you know, I may not understand the, um, you know, their contracts as they stand and what they, uh, you know, the action they can take to pursue me. And I don't want to get caught up in some lengthy, like legal situation in a foreign country. <laughs> and so I often do pay more than maybe I would otherwise. But so short of taking photos, which I always do, are there any other steps that people can take to avoid like car rental fraud or excessive post facto charges, which is I'm always afraid that's going to show up. If you have travel insurance, you're covered. So don't don't go getting their uh, coverage because that you're just paying for insurance that you don't need. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, there are reputable car rental agencies that will not do this. Any of the big uh, name brand car rental agencies, they're less likely to do it. But if it's a franchise location, yeah, maybe. They sometimes will work with third parties that handle claims for them and they will go after every claim. And you can go into the car rental trade publications and you can see ads and they say things like, you know, don't leave any money on the table. Let us handle your claims. We'll pursue them all to the ends of the earth, something like that. And so for them, that's, you know, a major source of profit. So don't deal with car rental companies that you've never heard of just to maybe save a couple of bucks because, you know, chances mm -hmm. are you're going to... You, you might get uh, dinged for it later on. And then the other thing that I would say is, here's a nice little trick. So uh, Americans can't drive stick shift. That's just unfortunately true. Um, but in places like Europe, everyone drives a standard transmission. And so what happens is that a lot of Americans will rent a car in places like Ireland. And that's like the, um, uh, that's double jeopardy right there because you're not only driving on the wrong side of the road, um, but you also have a standard transmission car, so you've got to worry about the clutch and everything like that. So what, what happens oftentimes is that Americans will burn out the clutch. And that's 2000 bucks right there. And they will get charged the full $2,000 for it. So here's an interesting hack for you. Always rent a automatic car. The car rental companies in Europe, they have, they have maybe one or two automatics um, on the lot. And they're usually really nice SUVs. Hmm. So when you rent an, an automatic, they're going to upgrade you to the next bigger car. Sometimes they'll upgrade you two or three classes. They'll say, well, you know, that's what happened to me. I was I rented a car in Split. We were going to drive to Zagreb. And uh, I had rented a small automatic. They didn't have it. So I got upgraded to a Jeep. And I didn't have to pay anything extra for it. Hmm. Okay, so... If somebody travels and they have absolutely no hiccups and everything goes well, 
they're in the minority and, and good for them. But if they're like most of us and they have some hiccup along the way or they run into some kind of a challenge, at what point can people engage Elliot Advocacy and how can Elliot Advocacy be a resource to them? Yeah, um, we help people help themselves first and foremost. If you have a problem, not just with travel, but with any consumer issue, and you contact us, uh, we're going to give you the resources that you need to fight your own fight. Because I think that no one is the mo- there's no more effective advocate than you for fighting your own case. So we will give you um, uh, maybe a link to a story that uh, shows you exactly what to do. And we'll give you a link to um, our company contacts pages where we uh, publish the names, numbers, and emails of all the executives. And we'll also ask you for uh, a paper trail that shows that you've tried to resolve this through normal channels and that it didn't work. And if it looks like you did try to do everything and you did everything right, uh, we'll go to bat for you. We'll try to help you. Uh, And uh, we have a pretty good success rate. So once we take your case, chances are you're going to be getting a refund or an apology or something like that. Who should contact us? I mean, I think you can contact us anytime you have a question. My advocates are always here, always happy to help. We have a really active Facebook group and uh, people want to help. I hate it when the customer gets screwed over by a large corporation. Uh, a lot, there are a lot of companies out there that do a really good job. So I don't want to like impugn all of them, but some of them really uh, go out of their way to make the customer experience terrible. And that's why we're here. What is something interesting you've been reading, watching, listening to, or doing lately? It doesn't have to be related to this topic, but it can be. <laughs> I'm so swamped with work. <laughs> I haven't had time to read anything. You know, I just, uh, I think the big aha moment today was I was looking at The Verge, which just did a big redesign of its site. I don't know if you've, have you seen that yet? Mm-mm. I mean, I'm going to do it now, but. <laughs> so the interesting thing that I thought was that We've come full circle. Now it looks like a blog again. We've come full circle in the last 20 years from having everyone write a blog and the stories just update to now going back to blogging. And I think that that's just so fascinating. I'm, I'm intrigued by simplicity. When I went to Norway, I was just blown away by some of the uh, Scandinavian design concepts and, and minimalism that they have there and the simplicity of it. And uh, it really made me think that if you keep things simple, you can be much more effective than being complicated. And I think that also applies to consumer advocacy. If you have any kind of a consumer problem, keep it simple, take your problem to the company and see if you can get it resolved. Do it in writing. And if that doesn't work, escalate it to someone at the company who can help you. Don't get complicated. I've seen people write all kinds of emails about how this made them feel. You took a wrecking ball to my vacation. My appliance blew up and I'll never have dinner again because my refrigerator doesn't work. (laughs) I mean, I'm not exaggerating. I've seen emails like this and they're really, they're not very productive. Keep it simple. Let them know what happened. Your product didn't work. Tell them how they can fix it. Ask them to fix it. If they don't do it, Go find someone who can help you. Maybe it'll be an executive or maybe it'll be a regulator. Maybe you can go to the Federal Trade Commission or the Department of Transportation or take it to a consumer advocate like me. But always remember what your goal is. You don't want to shame someone because they're working for a terrible company. Chances are they already know they're working for a terrible company. You just want to get your case resolved. So just keep it simple. I think that's really good advice because I, I think there's a tendency like this knee-jerk reaction or this I, this thinking that making it personal somehow advances your case more? No. In fact, it's the very opposite that if you bring your personal feelings into this and say, you've hurt me, you've ruined my vacation, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to me, it makes you look shrill and, it la- and makes you lack credibility. If you stick to the facts and you tell them what went wrong and how you can fix it, how they can fix it, then uh, it's much more credible. And I think that uh, you have a much higher chance of actually getting your, your problem resolved. Christopher, thanks for being here. This was a really helpful conversation. Thanks for having me.
Given some of the travel challenges I've experienced over the past couple of years, delays, cancellations, the need to arrive super early to airports, the long lines, the exorbitant prices, I've found myself sometimes dreading travel. But it hasn't stopped me. I have found some ways to mitigate some issues. So for instance, recently I got global entry, which allows me to bypass the long immigration line when entering the States from an international destination. And each time I use it, I feel like it's the best $100 I've ever spent. Additionally, I switched my primary credit card to one that offers a perk, a lounge pass in airports, which frankly is a game changer. I'm not trying to crowd lounges, but if you can find a way to get a pass, it takes a lot of stress off the airport waiting game. And I've also been doing a lot more travel in my immediate vicinity, traveling closer to home. All of these things have made travel easier. You know, I fully expect that travel will evolve. It'll never be the same as it was pre-pandemic. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. And folks like Christopher Elliott and the work he does can really help us to evolve along with it and ensure that we have the best experience possible when we travel. I've included some links to his work and his advocacy in the show notes. All right, check back next Friday and every Friday for a new episode of Deep Dive. Chat soon, folks.